Oops. One, two, three. <laughs> Not yet. <laughs> Wait for it. Okay. Okay, please sit down. A very good evening to our honourable speaker, Venerable Ajahn Brown. Members of the Mahasanga, brothers and sisters in the Dharma. Before we begin this evening... Oh, thank you all for coming this evening. And first of all, I have to say that the title of this talk, I never chose the title, so if anyone accuses me of controversial, being controversial, it's not my fault. But I'm very happy to talk about anything, and I'm very happy to talk about this. Uh, I arranged for a bhikkhuni ordination, I supported it in Australia. And there was a lot of uh, uh, problems for me afterwards, but in the end, now sometimes, as they say in Australia, if you go to make omelette, you have to crack a few eggs. In other words, so whenever you move forward, there's always going to be some problems. And that's always going to happen in the way that people advance uh, in our world. We won't get everybody supporting it. And the answer to the question, you know, has the bhikkhuni ordinations uh, got wholehearted support amongst the Sangha. Of course it hasn't. It never will. You'll never get 100 support for anything in this life. Even two people living in a family, husband and wife. Well, you do. Does it have 100% wholehearted support? Of course it doesn't do. We all have arguments and reservations. It reminds me of one of the men who used to do a lot of building work in our monastery in Australia. And he told me that after his divorce from his wife, he was so heartbroken and so stressed that he had a heart attack. Unfortunately, he was a strong man, but he was only living on 40% of his heart. The other 60% was dead. But 40% of his heart was good enough for him to even lay bricks at our monastery. So even 40% of your heart is good enough to survive. So you don't need to be wholehearted, even in life, <laughs> let alone <laughs> to move things forward with bhikkhunis. But one of the important things which I think people should know is actually to have more information about, you know, what are bhikkhunis and why are there bhikkhunis and how can there be bhikkhunis. To have more information about how the Lord Buddha set up Buddhism and you all know that I'm a very, very devout Buddhist and I do, do keep my rules and I do study and learn in Pali, learn Pali. But, very few people actually take the time to really appreciate not just the Buddha's wisdom in teaching the Dhamma or teaching meditation, but also the Buddha's wisdom in the way he set up the governance of the monastic order. It's absolutely brilliant. And many of you will know that just before the Buddha passed away, someone asked him, who is going to take over once you pass away? And with a response of one line, which really helped Buddhism continue to this day, he said, no one, no person will take over as leader of Buddhism but the Dhamma and the Vinaya or rather the Sutras and the Vinaya that will be your teacher from now on and so by not giving a person full authority but the teachings and the rules which were laid down that that was the authority there we had a person who realized the dangers of hierarchies. And this has actually kept Buddhism strong. And it's also kept Buddhism as the oldest continuous democratic institution in our world. The Buddhist Sangha has continued for almost 2600 years now. And its constitution is not hierarchical, but democratic. So, the way that the Sangha is organized is in autonomous units, monasteries, communities, where the boundary 
of their governance is the monks who live in that area, usually who live in a monastery. We've got something called a seema, like a, a parish boundary. And all the monks who live in that boundary decide on what should be done. Because of that, there is the opportunity for innovation. You don't need wholehearted 100% support of all the monks in the world. All you need is a 100% support of the monks in that local community. And that means there is the opportunity for innovation. Now within the constraints of the rules, but we can try new things. I compare those monasteries just like trees in a forest. There's a natural order. If a seedling is growing in a forest and it's in a good position where there's water, good soil, then of course it's going to be a very big tree in the future. If the seedling is in a sort of rocky area or there's not much water, it's not going to do well. In the same way, every community of monks, if it is in a good position, it really is practicing the Dhamma, as the Buddha said, it's keeping the precepts and it is doing things which uh, increase the faith of the local supporters, establish faith in uh, people without faith, it's going to survive and it's going to grow. Look at Brickfields Vihara here. How many other little temples are there in Malaysia, even in Kuala Lumpur? Why has this temple been so successful? And it's because of the previous chief and continued with the present chief. That's why this place has been very successful. Especially with you know, the former chief, Venwa Kesri Dhammananda. He managed to innovate. Innovate within the rules, but to do things which were going to be relevant, encouraging, inspiring to the local community. So every monastery, every community, every temple will innovate. And that's what it's meant to do. So that Buddhism, because the local area of government is the individual monastery, therefore it can innovate. So you, number one, you, there isn't wholehearted support, there never will be wholehearted support. All you need is the support of that one particular monastery. And then we'll try things out. And that's one of, maybe it's because I'm a Westerner. Maybe it's because that is what I was encouraged in my education. To take risks, to try new things, to see if it will work. And sometimes in life when you take risks, you fall flat on your face. It does not work. But what I heard in one of those um, conferences which I went to uh, in, I forget where, no, it was in Australia some years ago. Because when I go to conferences, I speak but I also listen. I don't just listen to Buddhism. I listen to all different aspects of our world, from psychology to medicine to, in this particular case, to business practices. And if you take a risk, if you try something new, and it doesn't work out, we call that forward failure. Now when you add the word forward failing, it means yes, you fail, but you've moved forward you know, in life, in society. Yes, you've learned from mistakes, but you push things forward. And if we don't, um, take those risks, if we're not prepared to fail, how can we ever go forward in life? I remember being a school teacher. I was a school teacher for one year before I became a monk. I think that's one of the reasons why I became a monk. If you teach teenagers after one year, anyone would think of leaving the world. <laughs> but, when I was a school teacher, I had to set examinations, I had to set tests. And to set a test as a school teacher, if everybody got 10 out of 10 or 9 out of 10, that was a bad test. If everybody got no 0, 1, 2, and the highest score was 3 out of 10, that would be a bad test. And the reason is, if everyone got 10 out of 10, what were you testing them for? They all knew what to do. It was too easy. If it was too hard, then people would get dispirited. So my aim was to get the average about 7 out of 10. Maybe some people get 9, maybe 10. 
and the lowest maybe five out of ten. Because as a school teacher, I wanted to encourage and motivate. I never wanted to give the impression that any student in my class couldn't do maths or couldn't do science. If they got you know, under five, it means oh, they were hopeless, they couldn't do it. And that would mean they would stop trying. But I wanted to find out, by giving them the test, what part of my lessons they hadn't understood. So when I only got seven out of 10, I could pick out from their results, get the feedback, this is those part of mathematics I needed to focus on in the next lesson. It was me getting feedback. You know, that's what failure is in life. It gives you feedback of where you need to put more effort, to learn more, to go deeper, to move things forward in life. That's why it is called forward failing. So we learn, we grow, and we do things better. And I think that's so important in any aspect of life, even in Buddhism, to sometimes take those risks and to see what happens. And of course, to take risks, you can't get everybody on board. Usually what happens is you know, a few people say, yes, we want to see if this works. We want to see if it happens. Now, can we have bikunis in our modern world? Let's give it a try. You know, a lot of people are watching that. You know, they're on the sidelines, and if it does really work, which it seems it is working, then everybody comes on board. They call that jumping up on the bandwagon. They all say, well, yes, I supported it from the beginning. But really what they were doing is just waiting and seeing. Now that's one of the first things. Hello, Venerable. Thank you, it's the chief here. I've already started, so if you'd like to give the introduction after the talk. <laughs> okay. We took a risk, you know, to stay to our retreat center. Now that was only just finished recently. Those of you who've been there to our Jhana Grove retreat center, and the other day I made a slip of the tongue because I was tired. I called it Jhana Groove retreat center. I prefer that, you know, Jhana Groove retreat center instead of Jhana Grove because groove, it reminds me of the 60s. It's groovy to meditate. And you get in the meditation groove. And it feels really good. So you know, sometimes you make mistakes and actually you, it makes things better in life. So we take that risk even as a monk because sometimes religions can be so conservative, always looking backwards, never looking forward, never even taking risks, to trying to do new things, to try and promote the Dharma in different ways. Again, within the Vinaya, within my rules, but trying new ways to spread that Dharma. For example, just uh, on Sunday, the reason I was in Singapore was for the Buddhist Film Festival. You know, the Asian Buddhist Film Festival. And you know, I gave a talk at the end of the film festival and just suggesting like, how we can take risks as even Buddhists to, actually, to move Buddhism forward. Because look, where do your kids, you know, what are they doing tonight? They're probably on the internet, they're watching TV, maybe watching movies, why can't we actually get these beautiful teachings of Buddhism into movies, into the mainstream, where people can really appreciate the teachings of the Buddha? So actually I was suggesting to them an idea I had a long time ago. When I was first in Thailand, I saw this um, cartoon strip in the, one of the Thai papers. And a cartoon strip was called, well, translated into English from the Thai, was called Super Monk. Now, Super Monk had psychic powers, so he could fly through the air. Now, if like a train was about to fall off a cliff, he could use his powers to stop it. But unlike the other superheroes, you know, like Batman and Superman and Iron Man, I don't know who the, who the other superheroes are you see in the movies, unlike those people, that the, the villain, the bad guys, would never be sent to jail. He would teach them the Dharma, give them the five precepts, and the bad guys would become monks. <laughs> what a wonderful ending that was. So I, at the film festival, I said to people, you know, we have all these superheroes, why can't we get someone in Hollywood, you know, to actually to do super monk? Because Buddhism is very cool over in, um, over in the United States. What to say in Bahasa is Karen. Is that right, Karen? 
Ukraine. Now, what, what's that like, called? Cool, popular? There must be another language. I go to too many countries. <laughs> I forget which country I'm in. But anyway, Buddhism is very popular in the United States. So you've got the popularity of Buddhism, you get a few psychic powers, you get a moral message, you get like a cartoon or whatever, and then you've got a winning formula. So like the Hollywood is always looking for something new. So Superman, and as it happened, as it happened, one person in the audience put up their hand and said, my ex-husband works for Steven Spielberg in DreamWorks. She said, I'm going to tell him that idea. So, coming to a movie theater near you soon, soon, <laughs> from Steven Spielberg. Now, of course, that's only the start of it. If you have a movie, you always have you know, the, the next episode. So after Superman, of course, we'll have to have Super Nun. Which we mean the bikinis as well. And then usually it's trilogies, so the third episode would be Super Novice. <laughs> so, it's called innovation. And if we don't do innovation, we are going to be uh, stopping, hindering this beautiful message of compassion and peace and forgiveness and non-violence. We are doing a bad thing by not spreading it as far and wide as we possibly can. This is a beautiful teaching. And, you know, you know how much I've got faith in the Buddha's teachings and living over a month for 37 years now and how much I still get really inspired by these teachings. And that's one of the reasons that I really tire myself out just coming to all places, you know, teaching, teaching, teaching. You know, it's because I really value this and I want to sort of spread it as far and wide because it's so beautiful and it's so helpful. I do want to make a better world. I think this is the way it can be done. So if we innovate, we can do more. But my goodness, how hard it is, is it to get good monks and nuns to teach here in Malaysia? It's so hard, you have to import them from Australia <laughs> at great cost. Can't you just have homegrown? But it's hard to have homegrown monks, isn't it? So why can't we double our sangha by having homegrown bikunis as well? To me, it doesn't make any sense at all why we should just have monks and why we can't double our advantage by having bhikkhunis as well. And one of the reasons that I was very supportive of bhikkhunis was a very practical reason. Buddhism needs more teachers. We can't afford as men to do it by ourselves. We need you, we need more. I know that because I get so many invitations, you just can't keep them all, you can't. There's just no, no enough time in the day. So that's one of the reasons. And of course, one of the other reasons why I really support it and why we, we did something about it, because that's one of the other things which I, I really object to in life. We have conferences, we have talks, we have all these seminars. And the first time I heard NATO, no action talk only, it's actually here in Malaysia. And that's, that's awful. Why is it that we talk, we talk, and no one does something? So I said, I'm going to do something. I'm going to have bikunis. It's really important to actually, if you believe in something, if you really want something to happen, don't leave it for other people. You have to do something. You have to take action. Strive on with diligence were the last words of the book. Don't just sit there, but do something. If you really want to help Buddhism, then don't just give on powers or donations. You come and support this Vipara. You go and clean the toilets. You go and volunteer on the committee. You do something. Rather than just sit there and say, oh, what a wonderful thing it would be here. In Bodhidharma Monastery, where I live, I don't know if you have this um, rule in, in the Mahavihara. If any monk novice or lay person comes up to me and has an idea. They say, I think we should you know, do another book of yours. 
I say, great idea. Anyone who has an idea like that, you have to do it. If they think of the, the Wiharanese painting, great idea, your idea, you arrange it. That, that stops a lot of people volunteering, but it does mean that if you have an idea, you want to do something, put it into action. Don't just stop at thoughts and ideas. We want action in Buddhism. We want to move things forward, to have more doers than talkers. So I decided, yes, we have to do something about that. And not only that, I knew enough about Buddhism, especially about the Vinaya. I've got a good mind that is trained in Cambridge. So I had enough understanding that there's no, there's no way that you can stop becoming. The biggest argument which people told me, which I believed at first until I got more information, is to get bhikkhunis, to ordain a bhikkhuni, you need another bhikkhuni. I need at least five bhikkhunis to ordain them. And they kept on saying in Theravada, the Theravada bhikkhuni sangha died out such a long time ago. That's what they said. And it's true, the bhikkhunis practicing Theravada they died out many years ago. But there's an important part which I know from my Vinaya studies. You know there's no such thing as a Theravada Bhikkhuni. There's no such thing as a Theravada monk, or a Mahayana monk, or a Vajrayana monk. All there is, is a Bhikkhu, and a Bhikkhu. And a Bhikkhu who happens to prefer the Mahayana teachings, or the Theravada teachings, or the Vajrayana teachings. But their ordination, their ordination, no matter in what lineage, no matter what Nikaya, what set, that makes them a bhikkhu. If that ordination is valid, they're a bhikkhu. Or they're a bhikkhu. It does not really matter. Now that's actually a very important part, which I got my head around a long time ago. And it made a great difference to the way I looked at people in the world. I went to sort of Mahayana temples. I know some of those Mahayana monks, they were really good monks. And they were doing what I was doing. They were keeping a very strong Vinaya. They were practicing meditation. They were teaching the Dhamma. You know, I thought, what's the difference between them and me? They were colored rows were different. But their practice, they were Buddhists, they were monastics. And I realized they were bhikkhus. And I was a bhikkhu. We were brothers, and the difference of Mahayana or Theravada made no difference at all. Look at you know, the Chief Venerable here. Is it, what Nikaya were you ordained into? Was it Sayam Nikaya or Ga What Nikaya? Doesn't matter, I don't care. I was ordained in Mahanikaya, Thailand. Okay, that was my lineage as it were. But that doesn't make me separate from the Chief. We're brothers. We're the same, we're sons of the Buddha, that's why we're brothers. So I can't see any different. All this sect and Nikayas, I think that's something which as Buddhists in our modern world, we should push aside. Now look, if, if we can't live in harmony together, how can we teach other people to live in harmony? All these different Nikayas and sects. But we're monks, we don't believe in sects of both types. <laughs> So we want to live in peace and harmony together. And it's not just you know, people who are Theravada can live together. People who are Mahayana, who are Vajrayana, they're bhikkhus. As long as their ordination is valid, then they're bhikkhus or they're bhikkhus. Once I really understood that, I realized, look, the lineage has never died out. Because there's bhikkhunis who have been in Mahayana, they have a valid ordination. It's the ordination which makes it valid. And so I checked out their ordination. Uh, some, mon mon some nuns visited from uh, Korea and from Taiwan many years ago, and I asked, can I see your ordination ceremony? I know it is exactly the same as our ordination ceremony in Theravada. Your ordination and my ordination is exactly the same, the motion and three announcements. I realized that's legitimate. Because it was legitimate, 
there were bhikkhus. I don't care what robes they were. I don't care what sort of uh, type of sutras they follow. As long as they're bhikkhunis, and they're keeping the Vinaya to a good standard, they could ordain other bhikkhunis. Understanding that, that was for me one of the keys which meant the bhikkhunis have never died out. They went to China, they've been there all this time, Taiwan, Korea, incredibly strong, their ordination is valid, they have a lineage which goes right back to the Buddha, so it's not a case of restoring the Bhikkhuni Sangha. Bhikkhuni Sangha has never died out. It's lost in some countries, just like the Bhikkhu Sangha was lost in Sri Lanka. And so what did they do? They got Thai Bhikkhus to come out. And they sometimes the Thai Bhikkhus, they lost, there was no Thai Bhikkhus. So they got monks from Burma or Sri Lanka to restore the order. That's all we're doing right now. So legally, legitimately, there's nothing to stop people or daily bhikkhus. They can be there. Understanding that legally there's no problem. Again, the next thing is why not? For many years, for me personally, it was a legal thing. I thought it can't be done, it can't be done. But I realized, yes, it can be done. Not only that, but realizing it can be done, the whole problem bhikkhus to me opened up the door to be friends with monks from all the different Nikayas and Yanas. I think you've heard me say before, these Yanas were Theravada, Hinayana, Vajrayana and Mahayana. That's fitting our Buddhism. I really don't like that at all. So I think the last time I was here, I said that I'm going to start a new Yana. Combine all the other Yanas together. So we can be one. You know what so your Prime Minister say? Malaysia one. <laughs> Buddhism one. <laughs> Imagine if all look, it's wonderful we have the Vajrayana nuns here. We haven't got any Mahayana nuns here. It's a shame, but Mahayana, Theravada, no the Vajrayana. So my Yana because this is you know, how I teach and how I think the Buddhism should go forward in our modern world. Take the H from Hinayana. Take the Aha from Mahayana. Add the Yana from Vajrayana. Put them all together and what do you get? Ahayana. That's Mahayana. <laughs> Add some fun into, into Buddhism so we're not so serious. Actually, that's something which I said in Singapore yesterday. Now I went to, I'm just wandering all over the place, and maybe I'm off topic here, but these are good stories. I was in Hong Kong in February, giving some teachings. It was a Sri Lankan monk, Venerable Dhammapala, who was, he was actually from Kuching. That's where he was born, but he was, went to study in Hong Kong, and he's really a good organizer, a very wonderful monk. And so he's staying in this Mahayana temple as the abbot there with Mahayana monks, Theravada monks and they're all working together, and nuns, all working together in harmony. And I thought this is a wonderful way that the Sri Lankan Theravada, Chinese Mahayana are actually in the same temple working together harmoniously. What a wonderful synergy that is. But you know, in the Chinese Mahayana tradition, it was very strict. So I go there and give talks, and tell funny stories, smile, make people laugh. And at the end of my trip, this Mahayana nun, she'd been a nun for so many years, she came up to thank me. Really sincere thanks. Not because of the teaching, she liked the teaching, but she said, I'm so thankful to you. Because before you came, whenever I smiled, I got scolded. <laughs> my disciples, my students said, Buddhist nuns are not supposed to smile. <laughs> but now you've come, I can smile. Thank you. 
So that's what I gave her. I gave her permission to be happy. <laughs> so, when we actually get rid of all this sectarian business, we, we Buddhists, we can work together. So, as well as making it legally possible to ordain bhikkhunis, it also meant that I could actually be more friendly, more accommodating to all the monks and the nuns from every tradition of Buddhism. And I don't know the, the Vajrayana nuns of that. Do, do you feel that sometimes you go into temples and you think, oh, they're Vajrayana, they're not one of us? Isn't that an awful feeling? Is it sometimes you go to you know, a Theravada monk, you can go into temple, oh, you're not the same sect as us, keep out. Where's the kindness? Where's the compassion? Where's the sense of harmony with children of the Buddha? And with the same father. We don't care what robes you wear. As long as we are Buddhists and have the basic sort of understanding of Buddhism, we're brothers and sisters. What a beautiful world that is. When we monks and nuns from all the different traditions, after all these arguments where we can make up <laughs> and live in peace and harmony. That's inspiring. So it left me with the idea of well, we can, just like Obama said. What did Obama say? Yes, we can. Malaysia Bole, Buddhism Bole. <laughs> yes, we can have bikinis. So once we say yes, we can, the question is why not? I know in my life, if anybody, anybody ever asked me, just like you know, the chief invited me to Malaysia for this talk, I don't say no, I think, why not? I have to find a good reason not to come. Otherwise the answer is always yes. That's in my life. If you ask me something, I'd always say yes. Unless I can find a very good reason to say no. My default is yes. Because I've got a positive mind. And I think it's wonderful. Buddhism should have a positive mind. So the answer is yes, unless I can find a good reason to say no. And I thought, why should I say no? Over in Perth in Australia, years and years ago, many Westerners, they saw Buddhism. These were, you know, Caucasian Westerners who loved the Dharma, who loved meditation. And they saw Buddhism and they said, we love everything about Buddhism except one thing. Where are the nuns? They actually said that to me. And for people in countries like Australia, they think, my goodness, what's happening? What type of religion are you? You're supposed to be compassionate and wise. Why is it that by your actions you are treating half the world's population as if they're second class? You're saying to half the population that you're not good enough or you're not qualified to join the Sangha. That is considered in the West just to be as bad as racist. As one person told me, despite, you know, in the United States, saying only white people can be monks and black people can't. Could we get away with that? Absolutely not. It's illegal, it's immoral. So why can I actually say that males can be Sangha, but women can't? Now you know what, most of those arguments, most of the conversations were monks. We were deciding on what you can do and what you can't do, you women. What does that feel as a woman? That feels disgusting. Why not ask us? It's our life. We want to become nuns. Why not? So the main thing which made me, this is totally honest, with absolute sincerity, the main reason why we had an ordination of nuns in Perth in October 2009 was because four women wanted it. We had four candidates. They'd been in ground robes keeping ten precepts for many years. They were very high quality candidates. And when they came up and said, we want to be bhikkhunis, that pushed me to say, yes, if you want it, 
of course, I cannot and I will not and I never will stand in your way. Even though I got the, I got the flack, I got the problems, they're doing fine, it's really unfair. They're the ones who became bikunis, but I get the criticism. <laughs> I don't mind. But they wanted it. And they had the training, all the boxes were ticked, so if you want it, fine, we'll give it to you. But you did have to get wholehearted support, but from your local community. So for for daily bikinis I had to ask all the monks that knew what might happen. At least we know, thought we did know, it was a bit more than we expected. And our local lay community as well, we brought it up in our ATM. Bikunis, do you want bikunis? You're the ones who have to support them. No, I can't take food to them. I'm a monk. You have to look after them. Are you willing to do that? And of course, it was totally unanimous. Wholehearted support from the lay community. Total. And that really inspired me. In the end, it's really the monks and the local community Yes, they would give the ordination, but the success of the bhikkhunis, that depends on you, the lay community. Because if you want them, if you respect them, then they will be there. Really, it doesn't depend upon the President of Sri Lanka. It doesn't depend upon the Mahanayakas. It doesn't depend upon any monk. If you want them, if you respect them, they're there. I know that's happening in Thailand. There are many bhikkhunis in Thailand. There's about three or four bhikkhuni monasteries there. The head monks. Oh, for those of you who want to know this, this is... The head monks in Thailand is they're not allowed to pronounce on the bhikkhuni issue because they are set up with a charter, with a legal document by the government of Thailand many years ago. All they can do, the senior monks, is, is pronounce on the monks and novices of the two main Nikayas. They cannot disallow bhikkhunis, nor can they allow bhikkhunis. It's nothing to do with them. It's like the government of Malaysia pronouncing on the election in Singapore. No, it's nothing to do with Malaysia, it's a different country. And because of that, the, the head monks in Thailand, they cannot stay either way. In the same way that, you know, there's many Mahayana monks, or monks who practice Mahayana in Thailand, the, monk, the head monks in Thailand can't say anything about them either. It's beyond their remit. They're not allowed to say anything, yes or no. Once I understood that, you can't wait for the head monks in Thailand to say yes, or no, they're legally not permitted to say. It's beyond their reading. All they can pronounce and deal with is monks and novices, male monastics of the two main traditions in Thailand, that's all. That was, that was actually told to me recently and I should have remembered that. So, there they are, we can have bhikkhunis, we do have bhikkhunis, and the success of the bhikkhuni sangha it's all to do with the lay people. So even in Thailand, it's becoming successful in Thailand simply because there's enough lay people who want to support. And they're supporting it, and it's growing because of them. Here in Malaysia, we have bikinis already. Two, you're both bikinis? You are? Are you? No, seminary? There's one bikini there. We need more. Bikunis will survive in Malaysia. It's not really anything to do with me. We can support their ordination. I can talk in public about it. It's up to you to support and respect them. If you regard them as Sangha, which you should do in the time of the Buddha, the, four, the fourfold assembly, bhikkhus, bhikkhunis, upasakas, upasikas, it was the wish of the Buddha to have bhikkhunis. That's why he ordained them. So they are Sangha. I was going to say one of the boys, but that's not quite correct. <laughs> They're Sangha. So please treat them as Sangha. 
What is the greatest gift? Somebody once said, oh, we want to give it to the Buddha. And the Buddha said, no, that's not the greatest gift. Give it to the monks. The monks are, and that's not the greatest gift. The greatest gift is to both sanghas, to bhikkhu and bhikkhuni sangha. If you look in the texts. So when you've only had a bhikkhu sangha, you haven't been getting the proper bang for your bucks, as they say. If you give it to the both sanghas, that's the greatest merit. So says the Buddha. Understanding that, you understand the importance of having a bhikkhuni sangha and how they should be respected and how they should be developed and cultivated. I know from the experience of having a nuns and now bhikkhunis in Perth, many women come up to me and they say, Ajahn Brahm, we really respect you, we listen to your talks, but you know there's some things we can't ask you, or there's some things which you, you're a man, we respect your wisdom, but there's some things which you will never understand, Ajahn Brahm. And we go to the bhikkhunis and they understand. I know my limitations. I'm not a monk who can teach everybody everything. So that's why we do need bhikkhunis. And I think that many of you women here understand what I'm talking about. You can go to another woman, a bhikkhuni, and she can empathize with you. She can connect with you in a way which I will never be able to do. I'm a man. And that's why the many women in Perth say thank you, thank you, thank you that now we have bhikkhunis. We can come and talk with them. And now we have a full teaching sort of complement. So that's why they really are supporting the bhikkhuni sangha over here, especially in Perth. It's incredibly strong there. That's why I'm sure you're going to see this soon from me. Right now, this multi-million dollar plan is to build up Dhammasara Monastery, where our nuns live. So soon you'll be seeing sort of pamphlets asking for funds for that monastery. And the reason is, because of all the publicity, especially about you know, the Perth Bikuni ordinations, you know that there was one person who has a, a blog, a Buddhist blog over in the United States, and he had the 10 top news stories in 2009. You know, and he worked it out by the amount of traffic on the internet. And Aung San Suu Kyi, you know, her, I think, uh, extension of house arrest in 2009, that was the top news story. And the Perth Bikuni ordinations became in number two. I was so proud. <laughs> it was really big news in the United States. And because it was such big news, that meant that we have so many applications of people from around the world who want to actually ordain as bhikkhunis and have a place to stay, support and also training. Now that last one is really important. It's not just support. It's not just enough food and a place to stay. The bhikkhunis, they want to be taught until they can have the teachers for themselves. They can be trained in the Vinaya, they can be trained in the Dhamma, they can be trained in meditation. So you have great teachers, female teachers, who can go around the world teaching meditation retreats. There are now, but there's not enough of them. They want more of them. So it's one thing to ordain bhikkhunis, but they need to be trained as well. And that means that when we have really good bhikkhunis, wise bhikkhunis, ones who can teach meditation, can inspire, then the bhikkhuni sangha is strong. Then monks like me don't need to work so hard to support it. It's self, it's independent. Just like you need, you have your kids. You have kids and you've got to really work and train them, educate them, look after them until they grow strong, educated and they're independent. Yeah, you can still love them and they come and visit you, you visit them, but they're independent. And that's what we really have to do with the bhikkhunis, make them totally independent by giving them that strength. And so it's one of the reasons, over in Perth, I made sure the bhikkhuni monastery 
is a long way away from the Mung Monastery. It's about 70 kilometers away. We're the south of Perth, they're to the east of Perth. You know why I did that? Because I wanted them to stop coming to see me to fix up their problems. Because <laughs> if they don't learn how to solve the problems themselves, they never grow. So I wasn't next door. Because what happens if the monks are next door, if they have too much influence by the monks, you just become under the thumbs of the men again. And you don't have that independence, that strength, as in the time of the Buddha, to stand up as an equal to the bhikkhus. Which in our world is really important. So, that's what I've done with the bhikkhus. And not all the monks support it. You know the majority do. The vast majority. One of the monks, a Thai monk living in the United States, you know what he said to me after the Bikuni ordination? You like this. He said, Ajahn Brahm, well done. You should set up another Bikuni monastery in Malaysia. He was Thai. That's what he said. He realized how much support that is here in this country. He told me to do it in Malaysia, of all places. <laughs> Your country. <laughs> He's a Thai. But he also said, he said, Ajahn Brahm, if you took a poll, and he was a senior Thai monk, and he said about 80% of all Thai monks would certainly support the kids. 80% would. Some of them, they stand on the sidelines because, you know, the politics, they just don't want to make their opinions known, okay, so they offend somebody. He said, I know these monks, I'm one of them, you have about 80% support. That's wholehearted enough for me. 40% of a heart was enough to keep one of my good friends living and working. He's still alive, I saw him about a couple of weeks ago. So 80% of your heart, of the monk Sangha's heart, that's enough for me. You will never get 100%. And if you wait for 100%, you're just waiting for Maitreya to come. And when he comes, I don't know when he's going to come, but I know women are going to die waiting. And isn't it a wonderful thing? The Buddhism of all the religions was set up from the very beginning to give that equality to women. 25, 2600 years ago, there were nuns, bhikkhunis. When many of the other modern religions are still struggling with the gender issue. You know, like with Christianity, should we have you know, a female pope? No, 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 no. <laughs> should we have female priests? No, 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 no. The Buddha settled that question for Buddhism 2,600 years ago. He said, yeah, why not? So what a modern person that was. What a person with incredible insight into the future. And look, now sometimes when I think about what the Buddha did, it gives me goosebumps. It's giving me goosebumps right now. The wisdom of that man, way ahead of his time, standing out above all others, no other leader did that. And there you are, followers of the Buddha. You should be so proud that the Buddha, all your women, respected you and set things up. So here in Malaysia, in 2011, the doors are open to you as well. And I hope that I can come to Brickfield's Mahavihara one day and I'm going to see a big foodie standing up here giving the double talk. And I see all the monks, me as well, sitting over there, <laughs> listening and saying, Sadhu, Sadhu, what an incredibly powerful talk. Wonderful, amazing. Isn't that the case? I don't care who gives a talk. If it's a really good talk, I get inspired. So I want to see that in my lifetime. I want to see great bhikkhus who can come up and fill this hall and inspire you all. And all you women, 
Well, that makes you cry. Should do. It might make me cry too. At last, we have this full equity. We're using all of our resources, males and females. So, if you have a daughter who says, Mummy, Daddy, I want to be a bikuni. What would you say? No! You have to get married and have kids. You've got to keep on the family. Filial piety. No, not filial piety. Buddha piety. <laughs> For goodness sake. That's one of the things, you know, I love Chinese people. But it's one thing about Chinese culture, which I read. I told this to the chief priest. He thought it was very funny. He repeated it after I told him to. Chinese people, they're so happy when someone becomes a monk, as long as it's not their own son. <laughs> <laughs> you thought that was very funny, and it's very true, isn't it? It's got to be someone's son, why not your son? It's got to be someone's daughter, why not your daughter? And look, there's a career path. What a wonderful thing that is. How proud would you be of your son if he was me and I was your father? Now my poor dad died when I was very young, but I often think of him. And I often think, that was about 45 years ago now he died, when I was 16. If he could see me now, just teaching, helping people, serving people throughout the whole world, he'd be so proud. My son is Ajahn Brahm. He's helping so many people. They're really helping them big time, saving their lives, giving them meaning, getting them through the crisis in their lives, getting people to be better people, teaching prisoners never to do that crime again, making positive contributions to the society once they leave jail instead of robbing and killing them and raping again. Imagine my son. Oh, he'd be so happy and so proud. That could be your son. <laughs> that could be your daughter. Why are you not proud of letting your children become monks and nuns? To me, I can't get my head around that. I can't understand that. Because a good monk, a good nun, they can do so much for this world. Much more than doctors or, or nurses or engineers or dentists. Much more than that. I, you can fix your teeth. You have to come back again next week to get it fixed up again. You can heal people's diseases, but eventually you found them, they die. But as Dharma, you fix up the mind once and that's forever. And that's fixing up big time. No more suffering. Oh, that's big stuff. Monks and nuns can do that. So, it's not just opening the doors so women can become bikinis. You also have to cooperate. If your daughter gets inspired and says, Mummy, Daddy, I think what I really want to do in my life is to become a nun, a bikini, <laughs> to train, and later on to go out there to teach. I want to, at this particular time, help in this re-establishment and growth of the Bhikkhuni Sangha in Malaysia. I want to be part of this. I want to do it. Never say no. Say, wonderful. I'm so proud of you. Because that's what's happening. It's not just allowing or letting the Bhikkhunis ordain. We need the raw material. <laughs> So they encourage people. And listen, all of you young ladies or middle-aged ladies, it doesn't really matter as far as I'm concerned. If you're thinking of becoming a big queen, thinking of all the suffering you're leaving behind, boyfriends, oh, they're a pain in the back. <laughs> boyfriends, always trying to please them, always, look at how much money you have to spend at the hairdressers trying to keep fashionable. Clothes, the makeup, well, that must be really painful. How many hours do you spend in a bathroom before you can go out? 
I didn't spend any time in the past. I did, I did actually uh, have a shower before I came up here. But that's all, I didn't pull up any makeup to actually to teach you. I didn't need to get my hair done. It's just so nice being a monk. I don't have to worry about even fashion. This old fashion of a robe is 2,500 years. We're keeping it this way. It's just such a lovely life. You have so many friends, so many people to look after you, so many people you love and love you. It's wonderful. Boyfriends are a pain in the neck. <laughs> you know what the bikini used to say? Uh, what's the time? Okay, maybe I'll finish in a few moments. You know what the bikunis in the Terry Garter, if any of you want to be inspired, the Terry Garter are these verses of the enlightened women in the time of the Buddha. They didn't just become bikunis, they became arahats, fully in line with great powers, the whole works, total equity. So, what they used to say is that once you became a bikuni, they used to say they gave up the three crooked things. So all of you thinking of becoming a bikuni, you're giving up the three crooked things. Now what those three crooked things was, was the first one was the ladle which people had to cook. You know, you have to cook for your husband, cook for your kids, spend all the time with cooking, 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 cooking. It must drive you crazy. As soon as you fit, sometimes I remember my poor old mum. My poor old mum, she'd get up in the morning to make the breakfast for everybody. And then on my days off, and afterwards you'd have to wash up, and then uh, maybe an hour break, then start cooking lunch. And maybe go out to get the food and then come back and start cooking it. And as soon as it was cooked, she'd prepare for everybody a nice lunch. Then she'd have to wash up all the pots and pans afterwards. A couple of hours. You know, my dad and me and my brother, we were watching the TV. She was in the kitchen cooking dinner. And I looked back on that poor lady. And she went to work, but she was also the cook as well in the house. So, giving up cooking. Oh, wouldn't that be wonderful? So much free time. So that's the first cooking thing, you know, was the, the label was a cooking thing. The second cooking thing was the house broom. <laughs> that was a symbol of housework. You know, I'm not sure what it's like in Malaysia. Things have changed a lot in the West, and now the husbands do a lot of the housework, but I think it's still in Malaysia you do most. There's sweeping and washing and laundry and all that other stuff. So that was a symbol of housework. So once you become a bikuni, no more cooking. People come to you, they come to me, they feed you. <laughs> that is an amazing thing being a monk. Not only do they feed you, but sometimes they pay you for accepting their food. They pick it up power, donation as well. <laughs> <laughs> so no more cooking, no more cleaning. Those are the two cooking things. And you know what the third cooking thing is? The husband, <laughs> or the boyfriend. And that's what they used to say, the three cooking things you give up. Oh, what bliss, no more cooking things I have to do with. So you women, give up the three cooking things. <laughs> and have the peace and freedom the happiness of being a monastic. So, many of you have known me for a long time, I've come here many, many times. Am I having a good time? Am I a happy monk? It's not just when I'm in front of you. Sometimes when I'm in your car, I think. When you meet me at the airport. You know, when people see me just when I'm not in public, still a happy monk. Do you want to be happy like me? Do you? Well, give up those three cooking things. <laughs> Thank you for listening. Uh, very good. Now, I'm not sure the last time I was here, but I have to teach you the three sadhus again. Because sometimes when people do sadhu, 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 it's just so dull and depressing. Depressing, depression is a big thing in our modern world. There's a lot of depression in Kuala Lumpur, Malaysia now. This is how to overcome depression. When you do something, give it everything you've got. So let's do the three sadhus again. Sadhus!
Sadhu! Sadhu! Did that make you happy? Yes. Now you understand why. Whatever you do, give it everything you've got. <laughs> okay, very good. So now we have the opportunity for Q&A and because this is a controversial subject, I just want some hard questions. And because they're embarrassed or they're criticised, then they'll try again. You're a young man, have you got a girlfriend? <laughs> if you haven't got a girlfriend, find someone here and just talk with her. Maybe she's got a boyfriend and he punches you, but it doesn't matter, that's called forward failure. <laughs> Because it may be that she hasn't. And there you go, you've got your love of your life. If you don't try, you'll never succeed. And I remember that as a young man when I first met no, I was not born a man. You saw a nice girl and you were afraid of actually talking to her. It was a great risk for a boy. You know, he felt embarrassed about talking to girls. Why I was embarrassed? Because I thought maybe she won't like me and say something rude. But of course, you had to take a few rejections. And then you find nice girls who say, yes, it's you girls. If a boy comes up and says something stupid, you like it. Forget that. Just encourage him. It's hard being a boy. <laughs> the same with girls. And sometimes you have to take risks as well. And sometimes you try a new hairstyle, a new dress. Sometimes it's the wrong one, but if you don't try, you will never find out. And in business as well, maybe personality in Malaysia, maybe you're not so good taking risks, going up to speak with someone you've never spoke to before, but in business, you know you have to innovate. If you keep just doing the same old thing, your business is just going to drive you. Innovation is such an important part of business success. And you've got to take risks sometimes. Some of those risks are going to fail, so you've got to take wise risks. Don't put all of your eggs in one basket, as they say. But take a few risks. Maybe five of those risks will fail. And the sixth one will make you a millionaire. And that's always been the case. Yeah. Thank you. There is no such thing as an embarrassing question. Please ask. So well done. It's not controversial because it does say in the Vinaya where it mentions the first ordination that by ordaining bhikkhunis, this is recorded, the Buddha said to Ananda that the Saddhamma, the true teaching, will only last Panchasatta Wasana, 500 years. Not 5,000, but certainly 500. Now, we've got a problem with that. Because if the Buddha predicted that, can the Buddha make mistakes? The Dharma, how long since the time of the Buddha? 2500, 2600 years? The teachings are still here. There are still people getting enlightened today. So, the truth of the matter is that Buddhism has not been shortened, it's still here. He said it would only last 500 years. He didn't say it would be shortened, he said the lifespan, it will live for 500 years and then it will die out. But it hasn't died out. So, did the Buddha make a mistake? As many monks have pointed out, that's the only time the Buddha made any precise prediction. And one of the basic teachings of Buddhism is the future is uncertain. So as many people have pointed out, that's totally out of character that the Buddha made a statement like that. Not only out of character with the personality of the Buddha, as far as we know it from reading the ancient sutras and Vinaya, but it's also out of sync with basic teachings of Dhamma. Me, I would say that could not have been true, but Buddha would never, never said that. He would never say that, that it would only last 500 years. He may say it will create problems where we can solve those problems. He may say that, yeah, sometime in the future he doesn't know when. 
But the other thing he said, which is much more how the Buddha would speak, he said, Buddhism will always be strong as long as there are people practicing the Eightfold Path, as long as there are people becoming extremely as ones return as non returners and arahants. Not monks, not nuns, both. So as long as people are practicing the Eightfold Path and getting results, Buddhism will be strong. People practicing the Eightfold Path today? Yes. Are they becoming enlightened? You may not, not, not know this, because we're not allowed to tell you, but the answer is yes, they are. So Buddhism is strong. Now that's the saying of the Buddha, which is in character. Buddhism is all about cause and effect. If the causes are there, you find the effect. It's not about predictions. It's not about 2012, the world's going to end. That is stupid. Buddha doesn't do fortune telling. So 500 years, that doesn't make sense. To me, and I stand up here and say, that is one of those statements of the Buddha, which smells, which looks like it wasn't said by the Buddha. It may have been added later. Some things were added later. It doesn't make sense. Basically, the Buddha would not say so. Does that answer the question? I hope it does. Anyway, that's my opinion. The question is, if it was okay just to have ten preceptors, then why did the Buddha establish the bhikkhunis? So the Buddha established the bhikkhuni order. There was a reason for that. And as many other people say, the other answer to that question, he says, well, wow. now if you ten precepts are enough to become enlightened, now why don't we just give ten precepts and not have any bhikkhus anymore? You know that when I was, became a novice monk, I had to become a novice monk myself before I took bhikkhu ordination. Yes, that was very important. But taking that prior ordination had a profound effect upon me. What it did was I knew that I was walking in the footsteps of thousands, hundreds of thousands, maybe millions of other people who had become bhikkhu since the time of the Buddha. I realized I was part of this huge movement towards Nirvana of the Bhikkhu Sangha. And that really uplifted me and inspired me. Ten preceptors, that was reserved for little novices, novice women as well. And you don't get the same uplift and inspiration. You don't have the same feeling that you're actually part of this huge What's it called like legacy of the Lord Buddha? Lord Buddha put it there. Yes, it is a problem, but only a small problem, which will be overcome. I've said this, it's controversial, but I think that this is what each one of you will know in your hearts. The bhikkhunis are on the right side of history. They're here. They're growing, they're going to stay. The genie's out the bottle, as they say, you can't put it back in again. They're here. And to me, it was, they wanted to become bhikkhus. It wasn't my decision. This is an honest one. Sometimes people say, oh, I jump wrong, you're responsible. It wasn't. Women asked me. There was no reason to say no. Therefore, I facilitated the ordination. That's not as much. Why should I tell you yes or no? I will not do that. It's your decision. You take the ownership of that come. You take responsibility. It's not in my position to say what you do. Advice? Only Buddha's only show the way. Monks, we can only advise, we can't tell. So, if women want it, then they can, and they should. So you can actually, you shouldn't ask that question of me, you should ask it of the bikinis. Why do you want to do that? And that you get some amazing answers, answers which I will never be able to give you. Why not?
I think that you know, sometimes with my monks over in Perth, sometimes I say, oh, in the good old days, we had to deal with frogs, we didn't have this nice food you have, we had mosquitoes, we didn't have... But I tell them, no, that was the wrong way of practice. And I said, it taught me endurance. And I was strong. But many of my friends, fellow Western monks, they disrobed because it was too tough for them. They could have been great monks. It was too ascetic. And I put my hand up there and say, that was going too far. I agree with you. So these days, the monks are burning down a monastery. I make it a point of making them comfortable, not too comfortable. <laughs> middle way. And that middle way is not hard. It's incredibly comfortable and peaceful. You don't indulge in with like you know, having a TV or movies. You, know, you have you know, your two meals a day now, you have a breakfast and a lunch. That's good enough. Look how fat I get on two meals a day. So we keep it a middle way. I agree with you that was too ascetic. Again, if you start looking at the teachings of the Buddha, from the time of the Buddha, people haven't changed. It's not the case that people were just so smart and so wise and so spiritually strong in the time of the Buddha. They were as wise and as stupid as people today. And to make that point, there's one of the stories I like taking. This is from the... I'm, I'm, just going off the subject a little bit, but I love telling the story. This is from the Bhikkhuni's Pajitya rules. And this was a story that once, you now in the monastery, in one of the Bhikkhuni's monastery, which was just you now on the edge of the city, in the early morning, one of the Bhikkhuni's jobs was actually to take the bucket from the latrines and dispose it in the compost, whatever they did with it. So she took the bucket they're full of urine and shit. Sometimes it's controversial the first time I used that word S-H-I-T. But I say that now because you use that word at home. So I have to use that word with you. The Buddha actually said this. Monks, you should teach in the local language. <laughs> so she took the bucket of urine and shit and instead of putting it in the proper place, she threw it over the monastery wall. And what happened? There just happened to be this businessman who was on his way to the palace to see the king. Now if you're on the way to see the Sultan, you're usually dressed in the finest suit of clothes and you've got your hair well combed, you're washed, maybe even have aftershave on. So there he was, finely dressed, and this bucket of shit landed right on top of his head. <laughs> now what would you do? <laughs> the man was incensed. He knew this was the nun's monastery. These bikunis, they, they should never been ordained. The Buddha was right, they're destroying the Sasana, they're destroying Buddhism, I can't stand this. Look what they've done to me. And he was so angry. He got a torch, one of the old torches, which were alight, it was early in the morning, and he was going to go and burn down the whole monastery. He was so upset, I'm going to teach his bikunis a lesson. Now there was a man who was at the gate, the gatekeeper of the monastery, and he saw this man, you know, with his shit all over his head, going in angry, and he said, what are you doing? I'm going to burn down this monastery, these aren't real nuns, look what they've done to me. And the gatekeeper said, my goodness, how lucky, how auspicious. Now this is better than holy water. <laughs> holy shit. <laughs> because many of these nuns, they're pure beings. And you got this over your head, this is your lucky day. Now you know how superstitious people are in Malaysia? How they get all these pendants, streams, and blessings from all these marks? They were so superstitious, he was so superstitious, he said, really? Is 
this my lucky day? They get me, yes, it's auspicious. <laughs> Something good's going to happen today. Look, go back home, get changed, get washed, go to the palace. I guarantee it's going to be a lucky day. <laughs> and he was so superstitious, he believed it. Now that gatekeeper should be the used car salesman. <laughs> You'd want him in your sales office at any company. But he went back, this, this guy washed, changed, he went to the palace, and the king actually gave him a big contract. He actually made this big deal, and he was so happy. He went around telling all his friends, oh, if you're very fortunate, walk past the monastery in the early morning. If you get, you know, this is really lucky. <laughs> and when the friends, they started you know, spinning around how fortunate it was to be blessed by these nuns, you know, the most personal walk you could possibly get, and they eventually got to the Buddha. And when the Buddha heard this, you know, he called the nuns, and he said, you were very lucky that you had such a wise and convincing man, otherwise you'd had your monastery all burned down. So he laid down the rule, it's one of the pachitias for the bhikkhunis, that you should not throw the bucket of shit over the monastery wall. <laughs> that is one of the 311 rules for the nuns. <laughs> now you can see, I'll tell that story because it's, number one, it's funny, and it's the sort of thing which might happen today. It's just people being lazy, people being superstitious and angry. I tell stories like that just to make you know that people haven't changed since the time of the Buddha. People today are exactly the same as people of 2,600 years ago. In those days, many people became stream winners, one returners, non returners, our huts. Lay people just like you. When I read that, I thought, why not now? Why can't people, lay people, become stream winners just like in the time of the Buddha? I realize, yes, they can. Remember? Malaysia Buddhist Borei. <laughs> yes, we can. So, yeah, we can. Why not? Thank you. Oh,
Baptist community and church from the Bay people, and they come into KL, they say, you know, they're, they're flying into KL, they need to get into town, um, you know, then somebody can come forward, somebody who's reading that page can come forward and say, well, I can have it, you know, and that will, put, that will help build up uh, uh, some sort of network for support. So this is what one part of it, the other part of it is to try to raise the profile
The young generation, if they have to come to temple, the monks are very serious. Do you think they are ready to approach the monk? No. They are very scared of the monk. They are very scared of the monk. So time has come without violating our great master's teaching. We have to address ourselves. When the devotees come, we smile. Just ask, good morning, how are you? Good afternoon, how are you? You don't lose anything, but you will get more things. Remember. So, this is not that easy to educate, not only even our devotees, even our monks. I try to send them to learn public relations. <laughs>
in my family, I don't have enough months or none to provide it. So now since they are looking for the place, why not you come forward to see me? I can guarantee huh, with to the Imran of the our venerable huh, before his next trip to care, I can introduce him. <laughs> Very good. So, in the, on behalf of the Malaysian Buddhist community, on behalf of the Britain, Buddhist Mahavihara, devotees and management committee and resident man, I would like to say big salute to the, our Virgil Ajahn And he really he has a heart with us. Uh, so, Definitely, you will be able to meet him as well as possible. And so I have given him a proposal. Three days retreat. Huh? <laughs> okay, hopefully, with one mission and one mission, we, I would like to have you to our Please give us three days within this year to organize. And the lady for the other devotees. And with this viewer, once again, we wish him good health and long life. And definitely, Bhante will be with you all the time to go forward. And today, as you know, if I'm not mistaken, in Australia, fastest growing religion is the Brazil. Then, in the other way around, China faster than the religion is Christian. <laughs> so, I mean, now we have a good example in the Jamra and we will be able to work closely to help and assist the Vipunis and I hope for the Hartman and the boys who have met, don't face with us. Huh? So, once again, any of you are willing to become a monk with the husbands huh? or gentlemen, please come forward. We are your friend you. Huh? Or <laughs> you. <laughs> so, okay, once again, big salute to all of you and with this merit. Will be by the power of the Buddha and Sangha. May all of you find peace, happiness, and good health, and long life, and finally will attain final salvation of Nibbana and this. Sadhu! Sadhu! Very good. Okay, very good. Only token, no? Huh? It's okay. It's okay. It's okay. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. There we go. My friend. <laughs> okay, got it? Very good. Okay, thank you.